Live City of the Mall. So the most embarrassing thing about what I do is I don't know what to call it. I personally don't feel like I'm a Disney historian because, that might be interesting. you know, this is other people's history that I'm finding and, and researching and putting together. This is about Jack Lindquist, uh, so he was Disneyland's first president, so these are just like a lot of... So I, I tend to tell people, you know, if I want to sound like an adult, I'm a video producer, and if they're under 30, I'm, I'm a YouTuber. And then I have to explain very quickly what kind of YouTuber, because that is such a wide range, you know, to, to throw out there. Epcot at Walt Disney World is a unique theme park with a unique history. Beyond its origins as a planned city of the future, it's been home to everything from popular festivals to interesting stage shows. It also has the distinction of being a Disney theme park that was home to a presidential inaugural parade. I think at a certain point, most people are just curious as to how it's a job. A lot of people think I work for Disney. That's another big one I get. They'll just go off and go, oh, so you, you, work, for the, you work for the company? And I have to go, no, I just sort of do this on my own. And that kind of confuses people. I feel like anybody over a certain age gets very confused about like how it all works together. And then on the same wavelength, like anybody under a certain point goes like, okay, you're a YouTuber, I get it. I get all of the, the gears in place here and what you're doing. It kind of started just because it was what I knew. I grew up going to Disney, and as I got older, I, that appreciation for Disney kind of shifted from, you know, the memories of going there as a kid to just appreciating all the work that goes into creating that experience. You know, it's, it's kind of run like a city. And so when I was in college, you know, I was, typical college kid, I didn't really have the money to go to Disney all the time, so my way of kind of coping with that was I read a lot about Disney, and so I would learn about all of the logistics and how it was built and all of this stuff, and so it became something that I just was into before I was even into YouTube, and then it really boiled down to like, you know, they say, write what you know, and at that point, what I really knew was Disney history. Disney goes all out in combating mosquitoes and minimizing their presence. How long would a new monorail extension be? $30 million anaerobic digestion plant. Comcast formally withdrew their bid to purchase the Walt Disney Company. From that, they calculate a unique number that then gets tied to your ticket. On paper, it all seemed crazy, but it was just the kind of crazy Disney specialized in. And I found that I just had a lot of fun talking about it. And then seeing that like positive feedback loop of you'd put out a video and people were happy to learn about this thing. And you go, oh wow, that this feels really good that I'm creating something that people are enjoying. And so you just wanna keep doing more and more of it. So it really just boils down to like, it's, it's just what I knew. Uh-oh, got a forest fire here. Anything to keep this interesting because otherwise I'm afraid I'll get bored and stop playing. It was this video game channel for a couple of years. It, it's weird, the channel never felt like it had a clear vision, which uh, at first I really liked, but it became very frustrating to me. I'm gonna be talking about Rob Plays That Game, I'm gonna be talking about Rob Plays Those Games, Rob Plays That Stream, which you might not have even heard about. Oh, okay. I started to feel like I was, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. Everything I was doing, nothing was particularly doing, you know, well enough to, to make me happy. Nope, it was a bad idea. <laughs> and I was at Disney, uh, it was like the spring, I think, I wanna say two years ago, and it was this really bittersweet weekend for me because for some reason, that was the weekend when I decided like, okay, this isn't, this is never gonna work for me. This isn't gonna be a job. I'm never gonna hit 100,000 subscribers. That's not the sort of channel this is. You know, Even if I do full Disney history, which is where I wanted to go with it, that audience wasn't there. And it was just a matter of accepting that. And I did, and it was, it was kind of bittersweet. And on that very trip, 
I was in a backstage tour uh, in the Magic Kingdom and they were talking about how they clean the, the water in Splash Mountain and I saw these barrels of bromine and I asked about it and I thought this is the kind of thing I'd want to make, a video about this. You may have heard a hardcore Disney fan point out that the water in Pirates of the Caribbean or Splash Mountain has a unique and memorable smell. They use bromine because it has a few advantages over chlorine. It's not nearly as harsh of a chemical when it comes to contact with skin, eyes, and clothing. It was one of those very freeing moments where I was like, you know what, I'm gonna make this video, and whatever, it's, it's not gonna be the thing that pulls in, you know, everything that I want out of YouTube. It's just gonna be fun for me, and I made the video, and a couple of weeks later, that ended up being the video that went to like over, it was at that point it was like nearly a million views and the channel went from 15,000 subscribers to about 30,000 subscribers in a matter of like a week or so. And so suddenly I went from this weekend where I had come to accept that it was never going to be a full-time prospect for me to maybe I should quit my job and give this a shot. I haven't hung it up yet. Um, I mean, this was something that I, genuinely, genuinely believed for so long was impossible to get. Um, but I just got it a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, I mean, it was an emotional moment because even though the channel really just started growing in the last two years, I've been doing YouTube for, you know, over six years at that point. So when I thought about that, I was like, this is longer, this is more time than I put into high school, college, any job I held, like that was more than any of that. And um, it was really cool to finally get that. And um, I haven't found a spot to hang it up in yet. Some might say it's not the smartest way to approach it, but I do one video a week. And like when that video goes up on Wednesday morning, I usually don't have solid plans for what's going up that next Wednesday. And so it's just reset the clock and go at it again. But I think part of what makes it really fulfilling is I love every moment of that. I'm usually researching four or five days out of that week. Researching and writing, like sort of back and forth. I'm reading lots of old newspapers, going into books. I started to try and cover topics that kind of veer outside of Disney, but are related to Disney. And those have been like some of the more fun for me to do. So like I just did one on the temporary flight restriction, the no fly zone over Disney and the history of that. And so half of that research was about Disney, but the other half was like on the FAA website and looking up obstacles and guidelines and stuff like that. You know, I'm not staying up till four editing because I have to, I'm doing it because I just don't want to go to sleep. I want to keep working on this project. When I left my day job, it was a big pay cut to go from like this really stable advertising gig to, you know, a, a, a YouTuber who's trying. And yet losing that pay was 100% worth it because that feeling of, of waking up and wanting to work on what you're working on is just, it's priceless compared to, you know, Sunday nights when I didn't want to go to bed because I didn't want to get up and like commute into the office and, and have that week ahead of me. It's been worth every moment of it. So it, it's, it's cheesy and corny to say, you know, it is a lot of work, but it, it never feels like it because it's, it's what I'd rather do. Once people get over the surprise that I make Disney videos, for a living now without being part of Disney. The second level of surprise is that I'm not the only one who does it. Like there's a whole community of people who, who do it. My name is Kenny Johnson and I'm a filmmaker with an odd obsession, Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. And I'm not the only one with this obsession. I love theme parks. I love that magic. I love that getting lost in a, in a really well-themed environment. I have an emotional connection with this place because of the family memories that I made. To me, it's never going to be a theme park. That's an emotional connection, someplace that you can really relive your childhood. Unfortunately, I don't live in Orlando, Florida. So to get my fix, I turn to YouTube and that's where I discovered a unique online community dedicated to Disney theme park culture. Which roller coaster are you most looking forward to coming to Walt Disney World? The Dreamfinder still holds a special place in many Disney fans' hearts. Today, it's all about restaurants that I feel like have amazing food. Disney is always best with friends. 
We came to the resorts and one of the things that I missed when I would leave is the resort TV because we'd always keep it on whether it be Stacy Mustus or whether it be just that resort channel. And I wanted a way to watch it on my own TV and pretend like I was there. And that sounds ridiculous and stupid and, you know, kind of almost obsessive. But I was like, I'm just doing it for myself. You know, nobody at that time we had like 22, 30, 40 subscribers. And it's like, okay, so these 40 people can enjoy it too. Initially, a lot of these channels started off as a hobby. And naturally, creating videos about Disney World became a job for some. I can't be afraid to try and make it a job because otherwise I have to go back to that nine to five life and then this becomes a hobby where it has to be, you know, something I do out of convenience and not something I could throw myself into. We're live at the Magic Kingdom! Yay! We are here and we're having fun. So what if I'm a guy that's watching this and I go, this is it. This is the way I can quit my, my nine to five. I can gain, you know, 100K subscribers and they can pay me to do this. It becomes a really weird warped mentality of like, this is what success looks like. The closer I looked into this culture, the more diverse opinions about Disney I found. A lot of people say a film is the true medium because it combines music and art and image and you know all those things into one story, all into one cohesive product. Um, but in reality, it's theme parks that are that. So everything that we've ever created has combined into what at face value looks like a, a children's attraction. The American holiday has died and in its place has born the Disney holiday because Disney has taken the American holiday and made streamlined versions of every possible American holiday and packaged them into a one-stop location. There was no such thing as, as an adult Disney fan when I first wrote this book. People be like, okay, that's weird, dude. Now, it's totally cool. Not only is it totally cool, there's a whole cottage industry that sprung up, especially on YouTube, of Disney influencers. What the hell is that? You can ride this attraction a hundred times. And because I feel like a lot of people see this whole career or job or whatever you want to call it as just like having fun, like having fun for a living, which in a sense is true, but it's also legitimately really hard work. Like me sitting in my hotel room editing all day while at Disney World, like that's not what you picture when it's like Disney World vlogger running around filming stuff. Look at this. Costume design in general is a, is a make or break thing, particularly in theme parks. And Disney does a really phenomenal job at costume design. And it's, it's such an interesting topic that no one really has ever covered before. I, I spend a lot of time in theater. I really like, I like performing, I guess. I like making people laugh. I like entertaining people, right? I mean, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Over the 60 plus years that Disney has been putting costumed characters in their parks, they have had some real winners. Some beautiful, detailed, elaborate costumes that just look absolutely stunning. I make Disney history videos about the evolution of costumed characters throughout the years. I really just stumbled into it. I really did. I just like Disney. I've always liked, you know, the Disney experience. And I don't know why anyone watches any of the videos I made early on because I had no idea what I was doing. And so Walt reached out to the Ice Capades and borrowed uh, a couple of the costume characters, including Mickey and Minnie. Oh yeah, here's here's that here's the part where I was like, I was like, yeah, I've got to um, because it's just it's just a glorified slideshow. It's terrible and it's got three million views. What? Like no organic transitions, no like, you know, but. Seeing, like, seeing this picture of Mickey co-opted from the Ice Capades, and so they needed to have all these vision holes, that's horrifying. This Mickey is terrifying. It's a nice little niche market, and uh, real life gets in the way of small creators like me, um, particularly because I did this because I just needed an outlet of for creativity, you know what I mean? Because uh, I have a real job, you know? I have a wife and two kids and a beautiful home, and responsibilities, you know? And being a YouTuber for four or five years, I remember the first time I made $100 in one month on YouTube, and I thought, 
Oh my gosh, this is the greatest, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened! Suddenly my wife couldn't be mad at me for buying all this weird Disney stuff because buying the weird Disney stuff was the tax write-offs for the channel that, it, it just kind of, I felt, it, it, it's actually not good for my personality, this disposable Disney income that I've stumbled into, clearly. Um, but actually I keep it uh, pretty in check and try to be very responsible. I've often joked behind the scenes with a lot of my friends that like I have a vision of my YouTube content on the internet being like theme park living, not just theme park information. My house smells like the Polynesian Resort when you come to my house, you know what I mean? Like I love having the soundtracks that are, are in the park, just the low key, simple music. Um, there's a, uh, this is Pirate's Life. Now you, you have to like, you have to, you have to understand it's the musty smell of bromine and like all of that, oh. but like it's all, when it burns, it really, you can't have that magic all the time. You have to be responsible with the magic, right? <laughs> Unless you have a huge disposable income. And so like, I love to bring it home. I like to have stuff in my house that just drops me into that, that Disney experience of Disney, that Disney life. Well, why Disney World? I mean, you're not far from Hershey Park, for example. Why don't you just make something on Hershey Park? Why, okay. why Disney World? Listen, this, now stop, all right? So this is the problem with everyone. You're like my grandmother who calls every electronic a Nintendo, all right? Because that's not how it works, all right? There's a difference between amusement parks and theme parks. There's a pretty dramatic difference, in fact. Theme parks, when you walk through the gate, you don't know that anything exists outside of where you are. And there is a beautiful magic to that that I can't, that, that's what's addicting about Disney parks. That's what's addicting about it. There was a time where you went to Disney World and you had no idea what was happening anywhere else. We're all in Disney World pretending together that we're on a boat looking at elephants, you know what I mean, in, the, in a jungle. It's not real, but we all laugh, we all love it. We're all in the joke together. We're on the illusion together. Well, it's also part of my youth. I have very vivid memories of going down there and just being like mystified. I was going in there like a, like a ball of clay and Disney World and their Imagineers and the crazy stuff that they do to make that ambiance. When you walk on stage, which is what it's called in the park, right? Everyone's a cast member and you're walking on stage. Disney World is a show. It's not a theme park, it's, it's the show. Walking through Main Street and thinking about all the people who made it, who designed it, who built it, who dreamt of it, who maintain it, there's just magic in that. Despite the evil sadness of corporate life outside of it, everyone still manages to make it magical, to make it an ex just an ex just an experience, uh, and that that's what's that's what's intoxicating to me about it. Versus Hershey Park or Dorney Park, you know, it's great that I can go to Hershey Park and it smells like chocolate and the street lamps are Hershey Kisses. It's great that I can go to Dorney Park and meet Snoopy. Woo, you know, my favorite. The magic of the park, and this is what bothers me a lot about being an adult who loves Disney parks, and adults who are like, it's a place for kids, come on. There's people who go on Twitter because, you know, uh, adults who love Disney World are like the worst people ever, you know, that kind of thing. Meanwhile, like, they've got a Kim Kardashian tattoo across their entire back they spent $35,000 on, and, you know, or they've got a basement bar decked to the walls with Giants memorabilia and jerseys that they drop out $250 a piece. It's like, Everyone has their thing that makes them happy, dude. All right, so you brought a couple of things here. What do we got first? First up, let's do the Magic Band chain. This has become a part of my channel. <laughs> 
this was actually started when Magic Bands first came out. Some of these right here are some of the earliest Magic Bands that are available. Some of them have actually a little bit of dust on them. These represent every single one of my adventures. Every single one. So I keep one and actually mark them with a date. With the date, I say like May 19 or something like that. I actually put that right there. See, I don't know if you can see that, but you see like May 19. Surprises in store. Today is a super exciting day because today I'm going to Disney World. Oh my gosh, this feels so good. And there is no line for check in, so I'm gonna grab my Magic Band, which was sent here before I got here. So I make vlogs at Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Line, all of my Disney adventures. Those are my favorite videos to make. I also make ones at home that are tips and tricks. I also make ones about my thoughts. So what I'm thinking about with a change that Disney makes or maybe an update to a policy, I'll tell you about that. I recommend Walt Disney World for a land adventure where you get to meet characters and ride amazing rides. Yes, I am known as the Disney guy. I work in a small office in DC, teaching the value of work-life balance to managers, employees, teaching them how it can really help their business continue to grow. But at work, I'm known as the Disney guy, and a lot of my friends will come up to me with different Disney advice. What do I do? Where do I go? Where do I stay? And I, it never gets old to me. This is an area that I'm pretty familiar with. A lot of things here. They have different shops and restaurants and all sorts of things. But we are a thousand miles away, and the weather is very different here than it ever is at Disney. And uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of positives to that in a way, you know, not as hot sometimes, but at the same time, I'd rather be at Disney. How much money do you think you've spent? I don't even want to think about it. The, tra the traveling alone, so about $300 from DC area to Orlando International every single time, that's round trip. The resorts, I stay at Pop Century a lot, I do that to save money. $800 for a week, something like that. So it's it's a lot, it is a lot, but it, it's my passion. It's just, this is what I do. When I take time off of work, this is the only thing I'm doing. There's no other time I'm taking off at work for except for a Disney adventure. Do you ever want to travel anywhere else? <laughs> In the future, I do want to go to Paris, Disneyland, Tokyo, Disneyland, Disney Sea, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Adventures by Disney. But to me, it's all about Disney. This is, it's part of the mentality for me. It's part of the passion. You know, I want to experience the world with Disney. That's just who I am. Oh my gosh, so much to do, so little time. Let's go experience it all. Those first glimpses of Spaceship Earth. I can see it peeking between the trees right there. Oh, those waves of Disney. Always feels great. Every single time, it feels great. I see the star of the show, Figment himself. YouTube became its own thing. I, didn't, I never expected it to get to this point. I never saw myself as, as doing what I'm doing now, not because I didn't want to, but because I just didn't envision it. You know, way back when, when I was a kid, I wanted to go and be a Navy captain on a ship and lead these teams and all this and, you know, in the military. And I wanted to do that for a long time because my family has history in the military. My father was in the Marine Corps, you know, grandfather, grandparents. But for me, it was all about Disney. And I started to realize as I got older that this passion of mine w went deeper than just kind of surface level. So. My grandparents, who are on my dad's side, who are no longer with us, I get to remember all the happy times. You know, for me, that's, that's how I go back and how I remember them. Part of the magic was always sharing it with my family. So I would go every year with my family, and as I got older, we couldn't take those family trips together. You know, I started putting up videos just of on-ride footage, you know, going down the roller coasters or walking around Flower and Garden Festival. And, you know, it started to evolve, and I realized that I wanted to start sharing my passion in a way that you could actually come with me. And in just 15 minutes, we invite you to enjoy Illuminations. I love it so much. I love it so much. People are always gonna say things. They're always gonna judge or say, oh, yeah, this is just for kids, just for adults. It's not for me. And I think to myself, you know, oh, that's fine, that's not for you, it's for me. But I think to myself, you know, more Disney for me, you know, more Disney for those of us who love it. We are now on 495. We have 12 hours to go. We just left about 20 minutes ago. Uh, as you can see, very emotional, very difficult, but we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it and we're gonna have a great time together. There's a combination of emotions in my mind right now. As incredibly excited as I am to be moving to the place where dreams come true, I am also a little bit nervous. I wanna to be totally upfront about this because 
Being close to the magic, in some ways I have heard, can take away from the magical experience. So I am still very nervous about that. It is on my mind, it has been on my mind since I first started thinking about how we're going to move one day in the future, and the future is now, which is incredible. Absolutely delicious, absolutely delicious. I love that one. The jam, it's like a raspberry. It's like a raspberry jam, but it is fantastic. Look at the crumbly looks like. You have to like that have crumbly taste. Has it changed? It has changed. It has changed in a positive way. I get to experience more of the magic and the anticipation. That's the biggest part that's really just kind of you have to get used to. It's like you don't anticipate it the same way. You have to enjoy it in a different way. So maybe you'll sit back, relax in the Magic Kingdom, sit in the Skyliner car and just enjoy the views. It's a different style of experience in the magic. But I want to be very cautious. I'm going to be careful with myself. I'm going to go maybe once a week at first or on the weekend every so often just to make sure I correctly acclimate myself. I don't want to just throw myself in every single day and say I'm bored of it. So that's very important to me. I don't think I ever will be bored of it. There we go. I live here and I'm a Disney vlogger. So that's what I want to do. It is fun. It's fun. There's is a lot that all to you do? There are going to be Disney vlogs all the time. Different restaurants, resorts, trying all the new rides, going in different orders, trying the festivals. I can't wait. I can't not wait for every single moment of it. It's going to be a dream come true. It is a dream come true. There are so many emotions, so many emotions. There's been tears, there's been laughs, there's been smiles. There's, oh my gosh, just, ah, so exciting. Good, how are you? Fantastic. I'm just watching you. My, my friends, and I call them my friends, you know, my fans is too, too vague to me. It's my friends who are joining the magic with me because it is a personal connection. This is my story. I'm sharing what's happening at Disney. When I see friends in the parks, you know, there's no like, you know, I'm not rushing around. Like, oh, I have to go get this or get on that. I can just, this change the magic, in my opinion, a positive way. Sleep before another magical day tomorrow and the next day 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 and I love it. Yeah, the mindset shouldn't be, I'm going to start a business. I'm no, if that was my motivation, I would have quit a long time ago. I would have, I really would have because to me it's just so much fun. Obviously, I don't need much motivation because I love it so much, but that is such a big thing for me. I, I don't ever plan on stopping until it isn't fun for me and it's always, I think, going to be fun for me. In November of 2019, YouTube uploaded a video addressing upcoming changes to their platform, which alarmed several creators. If you create content for YouTube, this video is very important to watch as it describes changes to the upload process, all of your existing videos, and potentially your monetization. If you don't set your content appropriately, this may result in compliance issues for you under COPPA and other laws. YouTube got fined $170 million for advertising to kids. They're like, we're changing everything. Come January 1st, all of this will go away on any video that is deemed for kids. The FTC will fine up to $42,530 per video offense. If you have a kid's channel, you're going to pay the fine. And YouTube cannot pretend that it's not aware of the content on its platform and hope to escape liability. It's affecting everyone, every single person on the platform. It's pretty nuts. It's very vague and it's very scary. The government is after content creators. Thousands of YouTube channels are gone. Basically, what I just found out today is that everything that I've done for six years has been rendered valueless. There's this huge penalty that could happen to actually content creators just like us if we don't comply with it. So I'm not a fan of the FTC doing this, I'm not a fan of YouTube doing this, but I am a huge fan of protecting kids. Ultimately, we can't provide legal advice, so we're unable to confirm whether or not your content is made for kids. So the analogy that I think of, imperfect, is um, the expression about shooting fish in a barrel. And YouTube is the barrel, and the content creators are the fish. Hello. Good. Can you see me? Okay. To get some clarity on the subject, I reached out again to Rob Plays to get his take on all the issues surrounding the Federal Trade Commission and YouTube. Is this the end of YouTube as we know it? Like, 
sure it's like the eighth end of YouTube as we know it because we had two ad apocalypses and now you have Kappa and like you had stuff before then. I feel like every year and a half we get another end of YouTube as we know it. This one seems a lot more serious because you actually have the FTC involved and they were fining YouTube a lot. It was like 170, 180, 180 million dollars or something. So, yeah, 170 million dollars. 170 million dollars. Is that how we're pronouncing it now? Is it Coppa? Is it Copa? I don't know. I feel like I want to say Copa because like, you know, Copa Cabana, you know, that kind of stuff. I want to like just, I want it to be fun and fresh. Who knows? Who knows what Copa is? Do you know what Copa is? What Copa or it was the Child Online Privacy right. Protection Act prohibits the collection of data from children. Every time I read about it online, there are so many YouTubers who I think don't understand what it is or what's happening here. Here's a simple version of this. YouTube violated the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act because it was collecting information from viewers under the age of 13 without parental consent, all in an attempt to serve targeted online ads to them. To settle the case, YouTube and Google agreed to create a mechanism so channel owners can designate when the videos they upload to YouTube are directed to children. But what videos, according to YouTube, are quote, made for kids? The initial guidelines were kind of vague. It was very black or white. While the, I guess the law has some gray area, there was no gray for YouTube. It's either it's for kids or it's not for kids. By marking these videos as for kids or not for kids, it turns off a whole number of features on YouTube that would uh, result in data being collected from a child. And whenever you try to programmatically or in a broad stroke fix something, I think it's going to end up breaking a lot of other things. All of this is just one of the many struggles creators have to endure when using YouTube as a platform to get their content out into the world. And this is where I think a lot of that fear comes from is communication or lack of it, which I think that is one of YouTube's biggest flaws is they do not communicate. And so for those few months, people were freaking out because like, where does a theme park vlog fall into that? Because plenty of kids watch like Michael K's videos, but I wouldn't argue that he makes videos for kids. He makes videos for everybody. Finally, I think YouTube put out a, an article, it might've been in their like help pages that gave a few examples of like general content that isn't kid specific, that might appeal to kids. And I believe theme park videos was one of the uh, examples listed, which I think added a, a great sense of relief to everybody who was like worried about this. We're putting all our content on a website we don't control. We have no say in how it's run. We're not in any of the meetings when it comes to where they're going to go in the future or how they're going to deal with problems. And when you hand over all that control, like, of course, you're going to feel stressed when changes happen and you have no say in them. But it's the, the, the trade off for the audience, because you know, at the end of the day, I could take the time to set up my own website, upload my videos, use my own player. I can even work with an, uh, you know, a programmatic ad network and get ads on there. Um, and that would give me all the control in the world, but nobody's going to my website in, in the numbers that they go to YouTube. So it's like the, almost like the, not a deal with the devil, but it's just sort of that trade-off you have to make is, you know, do you want the exposure at the cost of control or do you want control? And then, you know, it's an uphill battle all the time to just get eyeballs. A lot of us just take it for granted. They have this platform they don't even think about that's this delivery system for their content. It's like that American dream. It's that self-made kind of thing. I think that most people on YouTube, uh, with a rare exception for a handful of people I think are very, very talented, but even then, they, there's, a, there's a, a bit of this, we're all very lucky period. There are creators out there making content better than I make it. They're making content that's more interesting than the content I make, but they never find an audience. They never get that lucky break. They never get seen. All of us are lucky to find a platform where we have a direct connection to the audience. And if that platform goes away, it's no different than a creator who worked really hard on this show that ABC has, and that show gets canceled. Nothing is promised in any of this. Nothing is promised. And so you have to 
understand that if you wanna be someone who creates content like this, you are a hustler, you're hustling. It's a constant game of hustling. Maybe doing our keywords differently or changing how we do the description or our thumbnails or the title, or are we gonna use the premiere option? Or are we gonna use the end cards? Or, you know, there's, there's that game. But then there's also the game of hustle of, with the audience, finding your audience, getting your audience, getting new people to pay attention to you. And if it all goes away, then you're gonna have to figure out a way, if you can, if you have the drive and the determination enough, how, how can I continue to deliver this to my audience? The bottom line is there's always going to be an audience for Disney Park stuff, at least as well as, as long as my generation is alive, because that was the ideal vacation that was just sold to them. So about three weeks ago, my girlfriend and I finally moved down here. So we're now Florida residents. It happened really quickly. We were waiting for like a job opportunity to line up and it did line up and they told us, could you be there May 1st? And we were like, yep, we'll make it happen. And so we had six weeks to plan the move. The next week we were down in Florida looking at apartments. You know, it's something we were talking about for a number of years, I feel like, and we were just waiting for like enough of the reasons to pile up to push us over to do it. And that job opportunity ended up being it. And so uh, for the last couple of weeks, I've just been living down here and it still doesn't feel real. It's bizarre. I still keep waiting for whatever's going to push me back to my old New York apartment, even though it's gone and someone else has it now. Me and the other members of this community, we all serve at the pleasure of Disney. At any moment, they could say like, no, we don't want this anymore, and they could probably shut it down. I think their rules officially state that you cannot film commercially in the parks. And now if you vlog and you put it on YouTube and you have ads running on there, technically speaking, this is a commercial video, right? So, you know, on, on paper, I think there's a lot of videos we're putting out there that we shouldn't be. But I think Disney is kind of surprisingly um, open to letting that stuff happen. Mainly because I think a lot of what we're putting out there as fans and people who love the parks almost serves as almost like free promotion for them. And so I think they let that fly. And so I do think there's kind of a responsibility on our end to make sure we're being smart with how we use that, uh, that freedom because if it gets to the point where all of us are just going in there to break rules or show you how to work around the systems they have in place, that's when they might come in and go, hey, you know what, uh, you know, this ride's over, like stop filming, that sort of thing. It's one that I think most people understand and I think a lot of people are, are smart about what they're filming and when they're filming and you know, you could walk up and show, hey, they're building something over here, but they're not gonna like sneak the camera over the wall because that's the kind of thing Disney's not gonna like. You know, are you putting all of our freedom, you know, to film at the parks at risk by putting this spotlight, you know, Disney can't ignore it. At least on a scale where, you know, you're a defunct land or Disney Dan or, you know, your 100,000 subscribers where you have a lot of eyes on it and potentially Disney's watching, you gotta be smart with how you're doing it to keep that gray area gray in our favor. If Disney was to ask that there be no more filming in the parks, what would I do? Would it change my love of the magic? For me, not at all. Not at all. I have loved the magic since before I had a camera. So the camera came second. The magic was first. Eventually, something outside of the control of both Disney and YouTube provided the biggest obstacle for creators. Today's vlog is a life update. You have asked for me to tell you more about moving to Florida, how I feel about it, how it went, how my feelings are after a certain amount of time. Overall, gotta tell you, I love, 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 love living in the Orlando area. And these past eight months have been just so magical. And I'm looking forward to the next eight. Gotta tell you, just love it so, so much. Hey there, everyone.
everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, lots going on today. It's a kind of an emergency live stream. Want to come to you real fast with some very breaking news. As in response to the global COVID-19 pandemic, the Walt Disney Company has issued statements announcing the temporary closure of every Disney park and resort around the world, in addition to a suspension of the Disney Cruise Line. Extremely scary. Extremely scary. It cannot be understated. This is a very scary uh, situation for everyone. However, we have now received a new statement that doesn't just extend the temporary closure periods incrementally, but importantly, the parks and resorts will remain closed until further notice. And it should not be understated at how significant this language is, as the Disney parks have never closed for an indefinite amount of time. I moved over 900 miles to be closer to the magic, and during a closure, I can't even go in there. It's unexpected. It's it's scary for all of us, of course. We are going to be transitioning to those studio videos and live streams, so stay tuned for all of those. Let's let's do a few positive. Come on, positive times. Positive, positive. We're thinking. Come on, this is not a time for stress. I, I you know I have energy. Not a time for stress. Time for fun. <laughs> uh, I understand why Disney would close. I Every time I set foot, in particular in Epcot Center, because that was my favorite park, that's the park that inspired me as a kid. Every time I set foot in there, I would get angry and I would get depressed. Just because of all the stuff that had changed, how the park had just lost its way, the mission statement that it originally had had just been completely obliterated. It was a hodgepodge of IPs and characters and just total crap. You know, this is incredible art piece that you know is just so astounding it has all these different art forms all these different artists had to come together and make this incredible thing and then they bulldozed it i think what defunct land does is it kind of takes you through this thing it makes you fall in love with something and then it takes it away from you that pressure is there it exists you want to catch what's popular now so is there a little bit of competition yes absolutely they can add in a new ice cream cone right now, but somebody's already taken a photo of it and put it online, and now it's reshared, 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 reshared. It's fun to a point. 